Hey, thanks for tuning in to learn about the EGR probe. I'm Bill Partridge. I'm the principal investigator for a project to investigate combustion non-uniformities in multi-cylinder engines, the origins, mitigation strategies, so you can make these engines more efficient. And as part of that, we developed this EGR probe to track spatial and temporal variations in the, in the EGR. And I'm gonna tell you some background on this, how it works, and show you some examples of the applications today. I'm in a group called the Fuels, Engines, and Emissions Research Group. It's part of the National Transportation Research Center at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And as the group and name of the group implies, we do broad-based research related to advancing transportation technologies, including combustion research, dual fuel, catalysis research. But by and large, the work is very experimentally focused. So a lot, much of it is based on engine dynamometers, full engine scale setups. You see some of my colleagues working on engines. Uh, this is an interesting one where there's catalyst research going on on full engine exhaust and has some instrumentation where there's some diagnostics going on there. I think we were measuring ammonia. We do catalyst research, apply catalyst research, develop diagnostics, and then have wet chemistry labs where we will analyze fuels, fuel components, lube additives, condensates, et cetera. So that's, that's my group, but by and large, advanced diagnostics really drive our research, whether it's detailed diagnostics like I'm going to talk today or analytical methods for improved quantification and char uh, characterization. In my per particular group, uh, in my specific projects that I'm principal investigator for, uh, we've developed a couple of, couple diagnostics that have been commercialized, and I want to share those with you since we're talking about a, a, a third one. The first is the SPACE EMS, spatially resolved capillary inlet mass spectrometry, and it's used to study catalysis and really revolutionize the automotive catalysis, catalyst industry. If you were able to break open your catalyst, you'd see something that looked like this, a lot of channels that are about a millimeter square and it used to be people knew what they were putting into these channels and they could measure what was coming out, but they couldn't, didn't know what was going on inside. In this space EMS, it has a little capillary about the size of your hair and we can sample at the tip and we can move that tip along and sample to a mass spec and allows us to follow the evolution of the catalyst chemistry throughout. And of course, this gives us a much better understanding of how the catalyst works, allows us to make better design models, understand how the catalyst ages and in the end design better, more efficient, durable, lower cost catalyst systems. This one in R&D 100 in 2008, and it's been commercialized by Hyden Analytical. There's the commercial space EMS. Another is a fuel and oil diagnostic, and this has to do with fuel getting down in the oil in certain operation regimes, and it can get in this ring, ring pack and that's one of the places you can start to compromise the tribology if you have, have extreme fuel dilution of oil and you can have long-term durability issues like cylinder wall scuffing. And so we developed a fuel and oil diagnostic where we add a dye to the fuel and there's dyes added to fuel all over the world for, um, for tracking purposes, uh, taxing purposes, et cetera. So we just picked a dye that we could excite with a green laser pointer and when we excite it, there's some fuel that doesn't have dye added to it. You see, it's just scattering that green laser pointer. It's green. This fuel has some, the dye added to it, and it fluoresces orange. So we can differentiate the two, and we can, with a fiber optic probe, analyze the spectra, and in the end, characterize the rate at which the, the fuel is getting into the oil. What this allows us to do, the old method, it took about a week to get feedback regarding your fuel dilution rate, this takes that down to, to minutes, to ten, tens of minutes or tens of minutes. And so the result is that you can get a lot better calibrations. You can have a lot more confident that when you develop calibration to balance the various parameters that you use to control the engine, that it's going to go out and it's going to perform in the field. The consumers are going to be satisfied and you're not going to have long-term durability issues. So that, that took the feedback scales from weeks to minutes. So this one in R&D 100 Ward in 2003, and this was uh, licensed 
by Da Vinci Emission Services. Uh, Kent Frolin is the president of that of that company, and this is the they commercialize it as the Dafio. That's the Da Vinci fuel and oil. And here is the Dafio in one of our engine labs at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So we have a track record of of developing diagnostics that were, are responsive and applicable to advancing tra tra transportation technologies. These are usually in partnership with some of our industrial partners supported by DOE. Um, and I think that the, the EGR probe that we're here today to talk about follows in the same, same vein. The focus of the, the project where the EGR probe is developed is to enhance combustion uniformity of multi-cylinder engines. These multi-cylinder engines, they're very complex. They're increasingly com complex. And although you'd like all the cylinders to be behaving the same, practically they don't. Some, uh, they, they behave differently. You can have cylinder to cylinder, cycle to cycle imbalances. This can lead to control challenges. And when they're not all behaving the same, what that means is that you can't tune them all for optimum efficiency. And so you, this impacts the, deficient, the efficiency. Um, you pay for that with fuel economy. It can lead to durability issues. It can, lim it can limit your emissions. So this is why the project is focused on enhancing the combustion uniformity so we can maximize all these parameters here. Well, EGR can impact combustion uniformity because it impacts what the cylinder breathes. And this is how EGR works. You take some of the... This is the inlet to the to a four-cylinder engine, the exhaust going through a turbo. But we take some of this, this exhaust, it's usually cooled. There's a valve that injects it into the fresh air that's coming in. So you have exhaust and fresh air mixing right here. And ideally, they'd be perfectly mixed and all the cylinders would be the same. Practically, what happens is that there can be non-uniformities. There can be spatial non-uniformities. Here's a case where... In this cross section, there's a lot of EGR laying at the bottom. These are actual measurements. There's fresh air at the top. There, are, there can also be waves of EGR that move through. And here's a wave where there's high EGR here. And of course, if this cylinder breathes, when that wave is situated here, it might breathe a different composition than, say, if this cylinder breathes when the standing wave is there. But this can sweep through, through the intake manifold. These are some simulations from our partners at Cummins. In uh, exhaust coming in, EGR, fresh air, it's mixing. Uh, it looks like these, the cylinders, these are, this is, excuse me, this is the intake manifold. These are in runners to a six cylinder inline six engine. Looks like these might get more EGR. And you can see this wave, this plug of high EGR coming. It's going to move down and through this intake So the EGR probe was developed to, to address this issue, to understand spatial variations, um, to characterize different hardware, different control strategies, to space to make the, the EGR spatially uniform, temporally, temporally uniform, and so spatial and temporal mapping, and ultimately try to understand the origin, try to understand the origins of cylinder to cylinder and cycle to cycle combustion non-uniformity and develop effective mitigation strategies for enhancing that uniformity. So the EGR probe is developed to, to, make, to make these spatial temporal maps. This is, these are some more simulations of exa exhaust coming in for the EGR fresh air and it's mixing. It looks like it's laying along this top wall. And what the EGR probe would allow you to do is spatial temporally map the CO2, water, temperature, and pressure throughout this region. Other species are possible. We can also make line of sight measurements with, uh, with this probe. And with line of sight, when I say line of sight, it's, it's not spatially resolving across this um, through space. It's spatially integrating. So you get an average, for instance, if you're making a line of sight measurements there. We can do that with O2. We're making these measurements at five kilohertz. That's about a crank angle degree resol resolution at 1,000 RPMs. And so what this means is that you can resolve not only cycle to cycle, but cylinder to cylinder, and then even within a cylinder, you can resolve within, you can resolve valve events, and then even 
within valve events. It's composed of an instrument. There's an instrument that, that houses la lasers and detectors, optical sources, and it usually sits beside an engine. There's probes that are mounted on the engine where the measurements are made, and the instrument is connected to the probe with these optical fibers. You can see this is an actual application at one of our, one of our industrial partners facilities. There's also measurement probes. There's a translatable probe. Here's a translatable probe. Uh, I'll talk about more about the instrument and the probes in, a, in coming slides. Here's a probe that's in an intake manifold and we can move it across. This is looking down the main plenum These are the, of the intake manifold. These are runners going to individual cylinders and we can spatially map and temporally map. These are some more of the translatable probes mounted on the engine. They're actually here. There's also single pass and multi pass line of sight where we, we have instrumented exhaust systems with standard flanges that you can easily fit at different points in your engine. And we can launch those, those lasers across, across the, the duct and make line of sight measurements, either single pass or multi pass. The instrument's set up so that we can make measurements with four, sim four probes simultaneously. You, you might see four sets of uh, optical fibers coming out here. In this case, the, there were one, two, three, there was a fourth probe over on the other side of the engine. But it could be any, any combination of these translatable or line of sight probes. You could have two translatable probes and two line of sight probes with the same, same instrument. So it's configurable in that way. We've applied it to diesel and engine and diesel and gasoline engines, but it's applicable to other other types of engine, other engine fueled engines like CNG. For that, you might want to add methane up here. So I'll talk a little bit about the the instrument and in the probes, and then we'll show some examples of application, and then I will show you this this instrument and exhaust. And that's what I have planned for us. So this, this is looking in that instrument box and there's a lot of stuff in there. There's lasers, but here's a schematic that makes it a little bit easier to see. This is that box right here. It's not a CO2 or a water laser. It's a laser for CO2 spectroscopy. It's a laser for water spectroscopy. So sorry, if that's a little misleading, but there's a laser. This laser, we can split it into four beams and then each of these four beams can go to a dedicated probe. And then there's catch fibers coming back from the dedicated probe that go to dedicated detectors. And so it's the same system for the CO, for CO2 spectroscopy as it is for water spectroscopy. There's a little bit of difference in the way we split this lot, these lasers up though. Uh, for, this, for the laser for CO2 spectroscopy, there are these four free space elements and they're down here. They take up most of this box. They're these black components here. They're sitting under these blue components. But they take a, up a lot of this box. The same function for the water laser is performed by this little sandwich over here. And so we're currently working to, uh, to make it such that we can use this type of sandwich splitter for our CO2 spectroscopy. That's going to shrink this box down to something about the size of a shoe box. It's a little bit bigger than that now. So in addition, in addition to that, we have laser controllers that are sitting outside the box. We have data acquisition system and then a computer to control the, control the whole thing, analyze, acquire and analyze the data. We have a, a, a laser for CO2 that's around 2,700 nanometers. We're sweeping over a single line at, that, at five kilohertz. We're, we're sweeping over that line. For water spectroscopy, we have a laser that's around 1,380 nanometers. We're actually sweeping over five absorption transitions. I might call these lines or absorption transitions. Um, they're, they're, they're unique places where the light is absorbed by, the, by, the, uh, by water, in this case, by CO2 in this case. But you'll notice that we have plotted the absorption spectra at two different temperatures, and you also note that there's a unique pattern of the heights, of the peak heights, that's unique to a specific temperature. And so from the spectra, we can get water concentration, but from this unique uh, combination of peak heights, we can determine temperature, and then from the widths, we can determine pressure. And so from the water spectroscopy, we determine water, temperature, and pressure. And from the CO2 spectroscopy, we determine CO2. 
It has some temperature sensitivities that you need to correct for if temperature is varying, and we can use the temperature that we measure from the water spectroscopy to correct the CO2, uh, the CO2 measurement. So this is how we, a little bit of a quick background on, on how we do the calibration. And we have, we've developed programs in LabVIEW to, uh, LabVIEW and MATLAB to perform this, this, this work. So each of these ramps, this is where we're spectrally scanning over either this one line or the five lines for water. We're scanning over it at five kilohertz. So every time we scan this laser, every one of these ramps, we're making a measurement. We fit a baseline. This is one of those, this is, this is this one green circle ramp. Fit a baseline, we subtract the baseline, and then perform a least squared fit to the theory. And so there's one special combination of concentration, temperature, and pressure that will give the best fit. And that's how we determine the parameters. And then since we're making measurements at five kilohertz, we can, plant, we can plot those versus time or correlate them to an engine with an engine encoder to crank angle degrees. So here's some results, a four cylinder engine, so in cylinder one, three, four, two is I think the firing order. And what you see is that cylinder one is behaving differently. And uh, cylinder three, four, two, are behaving very similar, but here's an example of cylinder-to-cylinder -cylinder combustion non-uniformity. And from this, you can already see that we can resolve individual cylinder events. This is one cycle, 720 crank angle degrees, that's two rotations, uh, one cycle. And um, so we can see that we can see intra-cylinder intra, um, events. Oops. So that's the instrument. Let's look at the EGR, EGR probe that allows for the spatial temporal mapping. So again, it connect, this is a probe where the measurements are made. It connects to that instrument via optical fibers and waveguides. There's a, a schem, couple schematics and a picture. This is what I was holding uh, at the intro. And it's a 3 8 inch OD tube. And there's these measurement ducts at the, at the tip where gas can pass through. And when the gas passes through, it allows the light. You have light, you have the lasers and detectors, they're over in the instrument, but they come through these hollow waveguides, and the light comes down, it goes through these measurement ducts, comes back to catch fibers, and ultimately to the to the detectors. But in these measurement ducts, that's where the light can interact with the gas and the measurement, the absorption occurs. These probes are minimally invasive in terms of you don't change your hardware significantly in order to implement them. We drill a hole, we, we weld a, an NPT boss on, and can use this adapter fitting to mount the, mount the probe. And so there, we don't have to extensively modify it to incorporate a window, or we don't have to change the hardware and system that we're trying to study significantly. We can translate the probe using this graphite, there's a graphite ferrule here that's a non-swaging ferrule, and you see in this case, we've made some marks on the probe. Um, there's laser etched marks, they're just easier to see. In this case, we used a Sharpie, but uh, we were translating it uh, across this. This is some duct in the engine system, and we were translating it, it across. This spacing of these measurement ducts is about eight millimeters, and so that gives you an idea of the spatial resolution. We're working on a, another version of this probe where we can tune the, the width of the length of this to allow you to tailor the spatial resolution and signal to noise ratio uh, or, sense, or, or detection limit to the specific application. So you could change that if you want better spatial resolution. You could lengthen it if spatial resolution is not, not, not as interesting and you require more, more sensitivity. It's very robust to particulate deposits. Here's a case where we started the engine wrong, and you can see some, some black on the front of this probe. And in this case, again, this is one of our, uh, one of our industrial partners facilities. Um, once we learned how to turn the engine on properly, we could avoid a big slug of particulate at startup. And in that case, we could run for an entire shift all morning until it was time for the operators to go to, to go to lunch. That's what limited that four hours. 
But in this case, what I've done is that I'm cleaning the, the probe. It's really fast and easy to clean. The engine is still idling and we've taken it down to idle for safety reasons. I've slipped the probe out of this. I've just loosened this non-swaging ferrule, pulled it out, and I'm using a pipe cleaner with some isopropyl alcohol on it. Run it through, run it through a couple times, put it back in the engine, tighten down the, the, the ferrule, and we're back in business ready to go. So we didn't even have to have to stop the engine. So that's uh, you know, quite easy. <clears throat> this probe that I showed you above is made for cross flow when the flow is nominally perpendicular to the axis of the of the probe. We also have applications where the flow is nominally end on to the probe or parallel to the probe. And for that, we have a different probe tip that we can use. And I'll show you an example of example of this. So we developed the EGR probe, as I've mentioned, to, to map spatial and temporal EGR uniformity. But what we found is it has very broad ability to advance aspects of, of transportation or of engine development and optimization. And some of those are combustion uniformity. And I showed you an example of this before earlier. You saw it. We were making a measurement over here, and we actually saw evidence of variations from cylinder to cylinder. You could detect cylinder to cylinder variations by making measurements in the exhaust runners. You can measure them down here in this tube and then correlate the timing of the exhaust events to the firing order. But what we found is that the exhaust events will stay lined up like a train through the external EGR system and you can you can actually measure them over here in the intake in that that four cylinder trace that I showed you on the, the theory was, was just that. And so we're able to assess, are all the cylinders behaving the same? It's also used, been very useful for tuning and validating design models. We've applied it for this quite a bit. This is a design model. This is a, a 3D CFD simulation. We've made measurements to compare, compare to this. There's been cases where we have made, made hardware, or there could be hardware that's made to test a specific aspect of a CFD program. It may not be commercial intent. It may be designed to test the, the CFD itself. Predictions be met, could be made. Um, measurements could be made to assess the, the model. But ultimately, when you make better models, you improve your analysis-led design, as you have better design tools, what this means is you, is you can have faster, lower cost development of better engine systems, more reliable, durable, et cetera. It can be used to demonstrate control strategies. Once you can characterize uh, cylinder to cylinder and cycle to cycle and combustion uniformity via the measurements, like I showed, you can start to turn advanced control strategies on and off and assess do they make the, the cylinder cylinder, do they enhance the cylinder to cylinder cycle cycle combustion uniformity? So you can, you can use it as a measure of the effectiveness of advanced control strategy. You could also use the EGR probe measurements as active closed loop feedback for an advanced control strategy to assess the benefit that it would provide. Now, you're not going to have an EGR probe on the vehicle. But if we determine through using the EGR probe as, a, as the feedback, origin that the advanced control strategy is sufficiently valuable, well, then we can go looking for other more practical measures that can be used to implement it. So we've done the first one of these. We, we haven't used it as active, active feedback, although we, we, we tailored the hardware. We tra tailored the software so that it could be fed actively into the engine control system um, at the proper rate to do that. It's also applicable for portable emissions measurement systems or PIM system, uh, applicable for real world driving emissions regulations. They're increasing the, uh, these, are, these are systems that, that ride around with the, with the vehicle. There's a little pipe that, there's an exhaust pipe that clamps on the bumper that connects to the exhaust pipe and there's, it's instrumented with flow meters. There are extractive uh, measurements that go into instruments that are in the cabin. And so when we can make measurements with the EGR probe, actually directly in that duct, we can in parallel in situ measure both flow and comp composition 
in, in this way better characterize uh, our ability to, to quantify transients and, and startup compared to the extractive measurement. So we found a wide range that it's, it's really broadly useful beyond our, our very direct um, original motivation. Here's some pictures of, of application and it's some of the, these are all uh, on the road. Well, this one is in, at Oak Ridge, but the rest look like they're, they're on the road at, at our industrial partners facility. Here's a case where one of my colleagues is adjusting one of these translatable probes. He's got a wrench, he's gonna move it in and out of a duct. In this case, they were very interested in the distribution, the spatial distribution of EGR, a mixer was somewhere up here in this plane. So there's two EGR probes that are translated vertically. Uh, John's adjusting a horizontal one to map across, and then there's a fourth probe over here, probably in the runner for cylinder one or two of that engine. Another one of my colleagues, uh, Gurneesh, is, is, is aligning the instrument here. He's tuning the instrument, um, looking at active feedback. He's looking at the absorption lines. Um, I'm cleaning a probe. Uh, here's another example of that uh, standardized NPT boss mounting it on the engine. In this case, uh, there had to be a little plate made, I think, because the, the intake manifold was integrated in the head at this point. But on down for cylinders two, uh, no, this is six by four. These bosses are mounted directly on the intake manifold back there. And while the instrument and the probes are in the engine cell, we're sitting out in the, in the control room operating it. So there's three, I've got three examples of some work we've done to show you some of the capabilities of this instrument. The first is to resolve spatial EGR very uh, non-uniformities to start to track down some of the origins of cylinder, uh, cylinder to cylinder non-uniformity. So this is a commercial four-cylinder engine. This is the intake manifold. So this intake manifold mounts on the side of the engine, but the air comes in, the EGR comes in normal. There's a main plenum and these runners going off to the four cylinders. There's two runners per cylinder because this engine has swirl. And here are those standard NPT bosses that we, that we mounted to for probe access to the runners for cylinder one two three and four had to be up here there was a can sitting here here's a picture of the the egr probe when we insert it through these bosses we're looking we're looking down the main plenum here and you can see it uh, pushing through we can translate it across in this direction to map out spatial variations where is the egr is it how is it distrib distributed across this main plenum if we or for orientation when we translate you can see the runners down here it's normally that the egr is coming in the cylinder runners are taking off down to the bottom and the egr probe is nominally bisecting that angle well when we were we ran this engine commanding 20 percent egr and when we had the probe in this p3 location we're further down from the egr injection point we had got these red squares and you can see that as we translate the probe from about five to 65 millimeters, five to 65 across through there, the EGR is relatively spatially uniform at the command 20%. Well, we moved it to this P1 location. That's, that's the runners that are closest to where the EGR is injected. And we see a very significant non-uniformity. Once we get about 20 millimeters in, it's the, the distribution is then constant at 20%. So in this region, it's relatively uniform at the, at the command value. But down here close to this near wall, we have undiluted exhaust. Uh, it's like a river of EGR here. And so very high EGR near the wall, that's right here. It's very near where this cylinder runner is taking off. So you might not, you might think that the cylinder could breathe something different. Cylinder one might breathe something different than what is three. And that's where this data that I showed you earlier came from. This is cylinder one, three, four, two. And indeed, uh, it seems to be well mixed by three. I think it was well mixed by two uh, also. But certainly, we see evidence here in the blue trace that it was not well mixed. And, and there's evidence that, that cylinder one could be highly EGR enriched, which could lead to some of this cylinder-to-cylinder uh, -cylinder 
combustion non-uniformity. This is CO2, I'm sorry, CO2 versus crank angle. Looks like the legend got cut off a little bit. So here's evidence of, of steady state EGR spatial non-uniformities and some evidence of the origin of, of this, these cylinder imbalances. How about temporal resolution? You can see some you could see some temporal resolution in the previous one. We could see individual uh, exhaust events from the four cylinders, and you could see tran you know, some high frequency transients for the cylinders four, three, and two. Uh, but this is some other evidence that we do have cylinder specific temporal resolution. Uh, you can see the firing order one, three, four, two, one, three, four, two. For the black trace, we were giving extra fuel to cylinders one and three. And for the red trace, we were providing extra fuel to cylinders one and four. And indeed, we can resolve that the cylinders that have extra fuel are producing extra CO2. And so it's evident, more evidence of cylinder-specific uh, temp temporal or crank angle resolution. Here, some of these very highest frequency dynamics on the, are on the order of four to eight milliseconds. That's about 30 crank angle degrees. Not necessarily the, the, the temporal resolution of the instrument, but uh, shows you some of the high frequency tram transients measured in this specific application. So having this ability there's, has, provides a lot of, of uh, there's a lot of utility to having an instrument that provides this type of utility in terms of assessing dynamic cylinder charge impacts and imbalances, uh, combustion variations, Cyclic variability, this is something that we study in our group, which is basically a feedback from cycle to cycle and can be cycle to cycle between different cylinders. It creates instability and control issues. But nevertheless, we have a tool that we can start to use to enhance combustion uniformity in this way, gain back, claw back some of this uh, efficiency, uh, improved emissions, durability. Last example has to do, is a little bit different, and it uses this different probe um, for end on flow. We were measuring what's called combustion residual. And here's some, this is 3D CFD, and this is at the top of the exhaust stroke. And so it's the end of the exhaust stroke, and the intake, this is the intake runner, that's the intake valve. The intake valve is getting ready to open so we can go into the uh, intake stroke. But at the uh, this, there's this combustion residual, and what it is, it's exhaust that never leaves the, doesn't leave the cylinder. It doesn't go out the exhaust. And it's also referred to as internal EGR because it doesn't leave. It's not exterted, uh, externally injected through the external EGR loop. But when you first crack open this intake valve, some of that combustion residual can go up into the intake, intake runner and flow backwards. So it's combustion residual backflow into the runner. And so this 3D CFD has spatial temp spatially and temporally mapped or predicted how that EGR backflow is, is distributed. And we put our, our EGR probe in to measure it. And we were doing this to, tune, to assess and validate this CFD design model. So again, here it's a situation where we're not in cross flow. The flows nominally end on to the probe, and that was the motivation for developing these, this lift, lift probe for end on flow. Another thing you'll note here is that, uh, I'll show you some results of this experiment in a minute, but you'll also note that we're measuring, we're directly measuring two of the three components that make up the cylinder charge for this for the subsequent combustion event. We're measuring this external EGR and we're measuring the combustion residual backflow. When the probe's sitting here and the backflow hasn't arrived, you're, you're measuring this external EGR. When the probe is in this position, you're measuring combustion residual backflow. Well, this backflow, it's, this, it's, it's related to what never leaves the cylinder. It might be diluted, but with knowledge and it might be cooled with knowledge and models from this measurement, we can make a statement about this cylinder residual that never left. We can weight these components and build up an idea or a prediction of what is the composition and then make a statement about what is, or make a prediction regarding what's the next combustion event gonna be like. So we can measure 
with high temper resolution and high uh, speed analysis, analyze, predict, and then measure the next event. And so we're building up capability to comprehensively characterize the, the engine system. So let's look at these, these results. Um, here we were, we had the, the probe down the, the intake runner. And so what happens is that, is that EGR comes back, it starts, it, excuse me, is that combustion residual flows back into the intake runner. It first contacts the EGR probe and then it bathes the EGR probe with combustion residual. And then it and then it's rebreathed, and then it comes, it it goes off the probe, and that creates a pulse. Uh, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. But we were we had probes in this uh, this Class Eight diesel engine. It was Cummins' Super Truck uh, One engine, and it was a six cylinder engine. And each cylinder had two runners: a straight runner and a curved runner. And we had EGR probes in the straight runners corresponding to cylinder one, five, excuse me, six, five, and then one was over off to the on the other end of the engine. The main plenum is coming in here. It's very open in this region. You notice that the straight runner for cylinder six is very isolated. You might suspect that it might not get the same EGR air mixture as do the others that are in that, this more open configuration. But we made the measurements. <clears throat> we we moved the probe to different locations, backed it up, and each time made measurements with the probe in reference condition zero centimeters, one centimeter back, two centimeters back, all the way to seven. And what allows us to do is measure these two charge components. When you have the pulse, that's the, that's the cylinder residual or the combustion residual backflow bathing the probe. When it's flat, that's when it's not measuring that backflow. And it's meaning that it's measuring the external EGR air charge. So we can see uh, that variation. As we move the probe back, what we see is the width of this, this, uh, this backflow pulse gets increasingly more narrow. And that's obvious. It's, the, it's going to go back to a terminal location. And as you back closer to this terminal location, you're bathed in the, the EGR probe tip is bathed in that combustion residual backflow for an increasingly shorter time thus the shrinking width until you get to seven centimeters and that's the, the backflow never reached that point. So we can see several things that um, the this combustion residual backflow is different for the different cylinders and it's varying. We also saw that there were variations across. Sometimes it was, it was more biased towards the top or the side, or the bottom, etc. We can also see some interesting information in this flat line over here. It doesn't seem very interesting, but what this is telling you is that this is the external EGR air charge for cylinders one, five, and six. And you'll notice that they're all overlaying. And so it tells you that all the cylinders are getting this, at least cylinders one, five, and six, the straight runners are getting the same external EGR charge. This is not being starved over here. You'll also know that they're flat. They're not in, in this crank angle space. They're flat, there's no waves. It tells you that they're not only spatially uniform, they're temporally well mixed too, so they're temporally, temporally uniform. So we use this information to tune and validate a CFD model. Here's some temperature traces comparing the measurements to three versions of this 3D CFD model and used it to assess some advanced control strategies. So that's the, that, those show you some capabilities of the EGR probe, the translatable EGR probe and, and the instrument, both the spatial resolution capabilities, how you can, uh, how, how you can resolve transients. Um, and then they show you just some general applications too. This is, this is a different probe. This is the instrument and exhaust section. And it's something that we developed because we wanted to be able to measure oxygen too. And oxygen's very, it's, it's a weak transition, and we couldn't make that with the probe. And there is some benefit to making this standardized, standardized uh, exhaust section. It's, it's instrumented, there's standardized flange, which, which allows you to move it throughout your system simply by installing these standardized flange and moving this pre-aligned, pre pre-assembled uh, instrumented section throughout. Here's one of my colleagues, uh, again, this is it. 
uh, our industrial partners, there's a single cylinder engine over here and Gurneesh is aligning the, the instrument. So for O2, for oxygen measurements, we added a, another laser to the box. And so the, the instrument box that previously had two lasers for CO2 spectroscopy and water spectroscopy, we added a third laser at seven to 16 nanometers for water spectroscopy. It's uniquely weak. And so we had to go with this rather than single pass, CO2 and water, we're doing a single pass from top to bottom. So they were going once across this, this uh, three inch duct. And you can see the detector on the bottom. The light was coming in from the top going once across. But the oxygen, it's very weak. So we had to bounce it back and forth and make a multi-pass cell. It was bouncing between these mirrors, ultimately comes out to a detector and you can see those mirrors. And we can get the equivalent of four and a half meters of absorption path length by bouncing it uh, reflecting it back and forth and making this multi-pass cavity uh, in this get three four and a half meters of path length in this three inch exhaust duct that's stable to engine vibrations we were able to operate it uh, on an engine in addition to this customized uh, instrument and exhaust system or this in instrument and exhaust system we could also have custom single pass line of sight locations where we modify where the customers Hard, specific hardware is modified. There might be flanges installed at the intake runners and corresponding exhaust runners to make line of sight measurements across those. There might be custom, uh, you might install custom bosses or mounts at the turbo inlet out, et cetera. So there's different options for using the, the EGR probe, probe instrument, either with the translatable probes, this instrument exhaust system, or or very, very application-specific uh, custom uh, uh, probes. So I want to wrap up by, talk, by highlighting how this, this instrument is highly modular, mod modular, how it is very configurable and able to grow as a researcher's or customer's needs and budget and, cap and requirements and capabilities grow. Uh, we can add different lasers as the needs require. I, I talked about adding CO2, then we added a, a laser for water spectroscopy, and finally a third laser for, for oxygen spectroscopy. Various interfaces. Here's various ways that this instrument might be configured, and as, as the system grows, it doesn't abandon the old, the original components. You, you can add on to it. So I didn't talk about mid-infrared LED-based EGR Pro, but that's where this starts. Mid-infrared LEDs, they're very simple. They're very inexpensive. You can only, you can't, there's not enough power to split them. So you need to have a, a single LED with a single probe. There can be some, um, they're mainly applicable in isothermal environments. Uh, so they couldn't differentiate between hot and cold CO2. But in the intake manifold, it's nominally isothermal. And so you can do a lot of good work with mid-infrared LEDs. It's sensitive, it can be sensitive to some, some interference from other species, but still we did some quality work in the early days with that. Once you move to adding, a, replacing that with a laser, now you have enough power to split the laser where you can, where you can split the laser, laser and operate multiple probes simultaneously. I talked about four, four probes. It's easy to split the probe the beam four ways. You could split it six ways, or if you have a inline six or want more probes, you could do different things, or you could use these line of sight probes. When you use a move to a laser, it has significant advantage over mid infrared LEDs. You're all of a sudden more sensitive. You have linear response over a wider range of concentrations, so you can make more sensitive measurements up to higher EGR levels. Uh, you can add multiple multiple layers, m multiple lasers, and there's different the different probes besides the translatable probe. I talked about this instrument and exhaust section. This is nice because it really makes incorporating these line of sight measurements easy. Uh, all you have to do is install this or weld this standardized flange in your system where you want, where, you, where you want to make the measurement. This and this is a little bit more these custom in line of sight fixtures are very, again, application specific. 
But we continue to develop the EGR probe, mainly focused on adding additional species, hardening the uh, hardening the, the the device. We're working on specifically adding methane and, and CO right now, and we have uh, a number of patents and publications that are related to this this invention. And either myself or David Sims would be happy to happy to talk to you about that. And I appreciate you tuning in to to learn about the EGR probe. And thank you for your thank you very much.